Well, it's great to be back. Can everybody hear me? I don't have a microphone. Is everybody good? Good. Um, hey, one plug about Roots Tech. I've been a couple of times, and it's an amazing experience. They get 20,000, 30,000 people all congregating in the Salt Palace. And one of the cool things about the app is when you walk into the building, it has the capability of telling you whether you have a relative in the building. And you would think, you would think, well, maybe I'd be lucky and there'd be one or two. It turns out you'll get hundreds of people. They might be, you know, six cousins once removed or whatever, but they're in the building. And I know this because I actually, you, you can then interact and contact and email each other and meet. And I actually was able to meet a few third cousins who were in the building. And thanks to LDS and Roots Tech, they put us together. So it's an, it's an amazing thing. Uh, Richard, I'm going to do a little plug here. Richard mentioned the Sons of the American Revolution. There's a few of us in the room. Hugh Pickering is our co-historian there. Uh, we've got an annual meeting coming up in April. And in the back, there are two uh, handouts. Uh, this longer one describes the event. It's a three-day event, which has many terrific things going on. It's our biggest annual meeting yet because we're celebrating the 110th anniversary of the founding of the Nevada uh, Society of the Sons of the American Revolution. Uh, there's a gale event and so forth. But the second uh, handout is to sign up to attend one of the two or both uh, events we're having with spe featured speakers who are flying out from the East Coast. They've written fantastic books about the American Revolution. Uh, the first, this is in black and white, but there's a color version, uh, is Professor Dean Snow. He wrote a fabulous book about the Battle of Saratoga, 1777, hence the name of the book. Uh, he's an archaeologist and spent, has spent literally 50 years doing archaeological digs at Saratoga, as well as Indian villages and so forth. That's really his primary focus. But he is the world's leading scholar on the Battle of Saratoga. And I've heard him talk. I know him. It's a fantastic talk. Saturday night, we are really pleased to have a fellow named Bob Drury. Uh, he's a New York Times bestselling author, Pulitzer Prize nominee. He's written a book about Valley Forge, published about a year ago. Another fantastic book. Lots of surprising facts that you would learn about Valley Forge. So there's a tear sheet down here if you want to attend. It's $15 per or $25 for two, so you get a $5 discount. Um, but it's going to be a great event, followed by book signing and then a no host cocktail hour. So I really, you know, encourage you to attend. Yeah. Well, we changed it. It now says Atlantic, I mean, Atlantis uh, Resort. So we got, we got that fixed. Yeah. Right. So that's where it is. Yeah. April 3, 4, and 5. So Dean Snow is speaking on April 3, which is a Friday night. And Bob Jury is speaking on April the 4th, which is Saturday. Is this Jim Daughters come? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> Anybody can come. Anybody, Anybody can come. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to be a son. Okay, okay. okay. all right. We'll put on our white and <laughs> just march in. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us will be in our uniforms, but you don't need to have a Revolutionary War uniform. Okay, go ahead. I'm also the Vice President of the Nevada State Genealogical Society, which means I do the programming, get speakers to come in and talk, or I sometimes show webinars that have already been done with some subscriptions that I have and permission to do those. So that's what this yellow flyer is. We meet, we meet um, the third Thursday of the month, September through May, except uh, the last couple of years we haven't met during uh, December because of Christmas and crazy times for most people. And the second thing is just a part email that I sent out to our group over there. I mean, Sue graciously printed it out. Some of it is stuff that she puts out, and some of it's stuff that I've been collecting. And um, Sue always tries to give us links and things to do genealogical research that are free. And so that's some of the things that I was trying to highlight in this uh, purple sheet is some things that I found on the internet that are free, like the Journal of the American Revolution that's online and free. And then uh, Melissa, Melissa Berry puts out a free blog about New England research. And so I gave you the link in her email to sign up for that. And then um, and I'll have some others that I'll be sending out um, soon. Anyways, all for you. There's a third uh, thing that's on your desks. 
which is blue. This is a partial reading list I put together related to my talk today. It's uh, broken down into some subparts. Uh, some, the first page is basically historical books, uh, not genealogy books, but histories of New Netherland and you know the old Dutch settlements. Uh, and I would just say that if you're going to read any book on that subject, the most user-friendly and accessible is this book. Russell Shorto has written many great books. This one happens to be about New Netherland, island at the center of the world. Uh, he lives in Amsterdam. He's also written a book about Amsterdam, one about the revolution and so forth. But this is fantastic. You can get it on Amazon, I think, for 15 bucks or something like that. But there's other books on this list who I really, uh, that I really think would be worth your while. Some of them were written some time ago uh, in the 1800s, but they're still you know, very valid histories uh, with lots of you know, detailed information, also some detailed genealogical information, because as they write these books way back when, they were all capturing a lot of surnames and uh, land transactions and that sort of thing. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. So that's with you um, as well. Okay. How many here know or think they have Dutch ancestors? Okay, a few of you. Good. How many hope you have Dutch? <laughs> um, Pennsylvania Dutch. Yeah. Uh, when I was here in September, I was talking about Leiden and the story of Leiden, which, of course, was where a number of the Mayflower uh, passengers came from who founded Plymouth. Uh, I like to think that the story of New Netherland is just as important. It doesn't get the publicity. Uh, that Plymouth does or the Mayflower does, but it was equally important for some of the reasons I'm going to talk about. Um, so uh, today I want to cover, as Richard said, some of the history. I'm going to have to do this at a very high level, uh, but the books will give you more detail. And then I want to talk about some of the genealogical materials and also some of my personal stories of how I have tried to uh, you know, break through some brick walls of my own in my research. As some of you may know, researching old Dutch uh, genealogy is difficult, uh, not just because of the translation issue, but it's just difficult because of the relative scarcity of records. I'll talk about that. Okay, uh, wrong clicker. So uh, everybody probably knows the story of Peter Minuet and buying Manhattan from the Indians for $26, which is more mythical than factual. Uh, but you know, we're going to talk a little bit about the beginnings of what many people think of as the first example of the America's melting pot. New Netherland truly was. It was multicultural. It was commercial. It was industrious. It was complicated. Uh, it had violence, it had you know, every kind of drama you could think of, but it really and truly, I think, is our first melting pot. Everybody recognizes this? Mm -hmm. Old New York, actually New Netherland. This was from uh, 1660, and you can see, you know, here's the fort. It doesn't exist anymore. That was the fort to protect them. Here's, wall. here's the wall. Now, the Wall Street, basically. Here's Broadway coming down. But look at how dense this was. And if you were at my talk uh, about Leiden, Leiden and Amsterdam were incredibly dense cities. And this was incredibly dense. They packed in an enormous uh, number of, of uh, citizens in here. And of course, this wasn't the only place where the Dutch were settling. We'll talk about that. And of course, this wall here was to protect them from what? Indians. At least they thought they were imperiled, and so they built a big wall, and this was the wilderness out here. Actually, that would be north, right? Talk a little bit about what was going on globally that contributed to the Dutch actually coming to the New World at some you know, peril 
and setting up uh, this, this colony. So some of you know that uh, there have been eons of conflict, battles, wars between and among the Dutch, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the English to control the entire Atlantic world. That includes Africa, South America, the West Indies, as in the Caribbean, uh, and North America. And these were serious, serious uh, conflicts uh, for control, essentially. And it was the control of the trade routes and the plantations. Uh, some of us know the story of Brazil, but Brazil was a flashpoint in the history of the strife over the control of the Atlantic world because it was a very rich uh, area uh, for products and agriculture and things that would be trade bait. Uh, sadly, the slave trade was also part of this global struggle. Uh, the slave trade fueled uh, the commercial aspects of that international trade. So there was a lot of uh, conflicts going on in that arena. Uh, you can see Brazil, Curaçao, Bonaire, Aruba, many other places, but these were some of the principal uh, areas of conflict. Uh, the Dutch were in Brazil. Uh, they had been there for some period of time. Uh, and in 1654, during really the uh, height of the development of New Netherland, the Dutch were really more focused on their colony down in Brazil. It was far more lucrative. It was far more commercial, far more important than New Netherland, which was having some struggles, which we'll talk about. Uh, but they were overthrown. Uh, in 1654, they had to now completely revamp their thinking. Well, how are we going to make money? Let's go to the West Indies. And there in the West Indies, again, the English, the French, the Dutch were all fighting with each other for control of specific islands and ultimately, you know, the entirety of the West Indies. Uh, by contrast to all of that, North America was uh, raw. It was raw. Uh, we all know the story of Roanoke. Roanoke, basically a settlement that disappeared. The settlers nowhere to be found. It's still a mystery hundreds of years later. What happened to them? Other than a cross mark on a tree, you know that story, all right? Uh, so Roanoke was a failed colony. Jamestown, I mean the Jamestown Society, proudly, uh, but it had its struggles. And in this time period uh, of the Dutch settlement, uh, Jamestown was kind of an iffy place. It was not yet thought of as a successful uh, settlement. Uh, and I'm not going to get into cannibalism, cannibalization and that sort of thing. There's a little bit of that, but it was struggling. Uh, and Plymouth you know, had, had not even been founded yet in 1620 when Henry Hudson came along, uh, an Englishman but the captain of a Dutch ship, the Halve Mon, uh, it was the name of it. And he uh, captained a ship that came to what is now New York. You all know the story of Henry Hudson. So what, we, what was he looking for? He was looking for the Northwest Passage, uh, which was mythical. He never found it. But what he did discover was the North Rivier, the North River, otherwise today known as the Hudson River. Uh, this was a massive discovery, uh, at least from a European standard. Of course, the Native Americans knew about the North River. They, they lived there. They had their culture there. But this was the first European exploration of the Hudson River. And uh, Hudson kept a journal, which allows us today to have the details of that voyage of discovery up the Hudson. Uh, to the point where the ship couldn't go any further, but keeping track of everything that was going on, some interactions with the Native American tribes as they were doing that. Uh, and so that discovery was brought back to uh, Netherlands, and the Dutch West India Company already existed, excuse me, the Dutch West India Company was formed to coexist with the Dutch East India Company, was, which was very focused on uh, Asia, the Far East, and already very successful in exploiting those commercial trade relationships and so forth. 
Uh, don't ask me why it says VOC. That, that's the Dutch acronym. Uh, so historians refer to the WIC and the VOC as the, the, the twin uh, companies that really were exploiting worldwide trade uh, in uh, the Netherlands. Some people started to migrate, but the first significant influx, believe it or not, were of French Walloons. And if you were here in September for my Leiden talk, we talked a little bit about the Walloons. Anybody have a Walloon ancestor? There we go. Okay. So the French Walloons were uh, Reformed Protestants who were being persecuted like mad uh, in France. They uh, uh, fled to Holland and uh, many of them went to New England colonies over time. But they also made a significant move to uh, New Netherland, or what it wasn't called New Netherland at the time, that came later. Uh, but they were some of the first immigrants to arrive uh, seeking religious freedom. Peter Minuet's purchase, quote unquote, of Manhattan in 1626. I'm just going to go through this real quickly. We don't think about Sweden much. Sweden was also a superpower in that time period, and they were there too. And they came and went down the Delaware River and founded their colony of New Sweden. Uh, it was successful. The Dutch didn't like that. It was competition. It was just down the street. And so the Dutch came in and went to war with Sweden over control of New Sweden and successfully ousted the Swedes and took over that, uh, that area of, uh, of uh, what became New Netherland. 1645, a black mark in this whole story was what's called Kieft's War. I'll talk a little bit later about Mr. Kieft. He was then uh, the leader, the political leader of New Netherland, and he, uh, he did not want to coexist very nicely with the Native American tribes, and he went to war, and it was disastrous. Uh, it was very violent. It killed a lot of uh, people on both sides, uh, but it was a real black mark politically for Mr. Keith, and he was ultimately ousted by the WIC because it was jeopardizing the entire enterprise. More about that later. Uh, 1664, I say the first English takeover, there were actually two, technically. So the English went to war, uh, and it wasn't really uh, a battle. They came in with a massive armada of ships in the harbor. The Dutch saw that. They put up their hands and they surrendered New Netherland to the English in 1664. 1673, 600 Dutch soldiers show up, and with 600 soldiers, they took it back. Very odd uh, moment in history. They took it back. They survived for a few months. And in 1674, there was a treaty, which we'll talk about, and they regained possession. So that's a very high level. So we talk about New Netherland. It sounds like it's all Dutch. It wasn't. Uh, when I emphasized earlier about the multicultural aspect of New Netherland, truly it was a melting pot. Uh, of course, there were peoples from the Dutch United Republic, uh, from all areas, actually. My family came from New Utrecht, which is east um, towards the German border. But there was New Amsterdam and the other uh, areas of uh, the Dutch United Republic. Uh, people came in groups. So the New Utrecht people coming from Utrecht were farmers. So a group of farmers from there. The Amsterdam, Amsterdam folks were more commercial. So you had a, a, a mix of, of Dutch. You had the Huguenots and the Walloons. Uh, I misspoke when I was talking about the Walloons. So uh, the Walloons were not French. The Huguenots were French. The Walloons were actually from what's now Belgium. There's actually an area in Belgium today called Wallonia. And the Walloons likewise were being persecuted. Um, they were Dutch, I mean, excuse me, they were Reformed Protestants as well. They also fled to Holland, and then they came to the New World. So we had Huguenots and Walloons. We had the Swedes, as I mentioned, quite a significant Jewish population. We'll talk later about how they were persecuted. Uh, a lot of immigrants from South America and the West Indies, both Caucasian 
and otherwise, uh, slaves uh, were prominent. Uh, I can't tell you the percentage of the population, but it was significant. Uh, and then English. <laughs> uh, our president of the, or excuse me, our governor of the Mayflower Society uh, talks about one of his ancestors, um, uh, Allerton, Allerton, a, a well-regarded uh, Plymouth uh, Mayflower uh, ancestor. Well, he fled Plymouth and went to New Netherland to make a buck. He didn't see that there was much commercial wherewithal happening in Plymouth, and he said, well, I'm going to go down there. So, so there were pilgrims, and by the way, Another one was, uh, who has any descent from uh, the Delanos, the Delanois, anybody? So Philippe Delanois came on the second ship to New England in 1621. That name, Delanois, was French. It got Americanized into Delano, as in Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So some of the Delanos came to New Netherland, too, from New England. Uh, okay, we talked a little bit about the WIC. What was it? Why was this a significant company? Well, like the uh, Dutch East India Company, it was given a charter from the government to basically engage in this uh, effort to exploit the New World. It had incredible authority. Pretty much the government said, you go take care of everything. They had the power to uh, make laws, enforce laws, create government, um, uh, re really run the whole show, and, uh, and they did. And this was true not just in North America, but all over the Atlantic seaboard where they had uh, significant settlements, including in Africa where they were part of the slave trade. So they had almost a trifecta situation. They had Africa, they had South America, they had North America, and they were all trading back and forth with each other. Ships would go in one direction with one cargo, sometimes slaves, return with some other cargo. So it was a quite uh, triangular relationship they had. Uh, so they, had their, they were run by the Herren 19, the Lords 19. So there were 19 people sitting in uh, Holland who uh, gave guidance to the colony. Uh, you see here I say that it was dominated by Amsterdam and Zeeland. That's another area of Holland. And they were sort of the twin powers in deciding what the leaders in New Netherland could or could not do. Uh, but this was all under the, under the overall control of this entity, the Dutch uh, West India Company. This last one is an important one to, to think about. It was what they struggled with as a company really as a, uh, as a commercial enterprise is, well, are we there just to have a commercial, successful commercial venture, or are we going to colonize? Those are two very different models for a colony. Uh, ultimately, the decision was made that it was going to be both, uh, but a significant effort then made to colonize. So we see here, this is just for fun, uh, this was the contract to sell Manhattan to the Dutch in 1626. Uh, this is an example, this was in 1630. Uh, they literally put out flyers uh, in Holland saying, we've got this colony, it's great, you can be, live a great life there, please come. And some of it was, you know, fake news. Uh, but it did convince quite a few people to get on ships and come to the New World. So they were really starting to push in this period of 1626 and on through actually 1650 to bring people to the colony. Families, they wanted women, they wanted childbearing women, they wanted to have next generation people uh, growing up and living there. So it wasn't just trying to find, you know, men. Uh, it was a widespread effort to move entire families uh, there. And over time, 
uh, I've got this map here just to illustrate it. New Netherland, from that tip of Wall Street, just expanded dramatically. It went, oops, let me get my thing here. So you can see Long Island, today's Long Island. Here's the Hudson River. Up, up, up. This is the Connecticut River, River, which at the time was a very vital waterway. We don't think about Connecticut much as a historically important thing, but the Connecticut River was a hugely important waterway to the extent that, uh, you can't read it here, but Fort Hope was built here by the Dutch to protect those commercial interests. Um, one of which was beaver pelts. I mean, that's, that was a big deal, just as it was in Plymouth and New England. So, uh, pardon me? Fort Hope. Fort Hope, right. Uh, up here at the very top of the Hudson River, or the Norte River, uh, was Fort Orange, another fort, very important fort. Um, and that was about the only fort that survived. Ultimately, the English came down from New England and overran the, the territory of Connecticut. But at the time, this was all Dutch and going down the Delaware River, down here. So here's where New Sweden was, but taken over by the Dutch. Huge area. And I've given you the Dutch names for some of these rivers. So the Varsha River was the Connecticut River. The Zuid Trivier uh, was the Delaware River. I don't know Dutch, but I'm trying. OK, clicker. Uh, I mentioned uh, conflicts with Native Americans. They were pronounced. They were ongoing. Uh, it was the dark story of not just New Netherland, but New England and Jamestown and all of those early colonies, uh, invariably there were conflicts. Lots of tribes living side by side with the Dutch in this time period and frequent battles. You see here, Keefe's War wasn't just that. Uh, there was also something called the Peach War, started by uh, a couple of Indians who were uh, off the reservation, so to speak, uh, killed some settlers who were out in their peach orchard. That incited an incredible war and retribution back against the Indians. So that was called the Peach War. And then the Esopus Wars, I don't, I can't tell you why it was called that, but it was a very big conflict with the Indians. So this went on and on and on throughout the time period up until when the British took over and thereafter. So the British were not immune to this. And in fact, the, the English to a certain extent uh, provoked the same sorts of conflicts because they were expansive wanted to control all the land as they were doing in New England. So the, this, this story of expansion you know, continued after 1675. Uh, just a quick rundown. So they had six leaders uh, start to finish in the colony. The first guy, uh, Cornelius May, was actually the captain of one of the first ships bringing the Walloons over, and he lasted about a year, and then his successor about a year, Peter Minuet, a few more years, till we get to William Keefe here, 1638-47. He was a tyrant. There's no other way to put it. He was despised. He was corrupt. He was a tyrant. Uh, but he ran with an iron fist, ran the colony with an iron fist, ultimately uh, shown uh, the door because of his provocation in Keefe's war. And then finally, Peter Stuyvesant, who was uh, the ruler for you know, many, many years, the longest ruler, in fact. And it was a checkered rule. Uh, just as we stop and think about good things that were happening, he did uh, accomplish a lot. He expanded the colony tremendously under his leadership. He did report to a council. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, it was his colony. Uh, he ignored uh, decisions of the council. 
uh, he ignored lots of advice about how to run the colony. He just ran it. And sometimes he was an absent uh, uh, ruler. He went down to the West Indies and stayed there for long lengths of time. Nobody could reach him, uh, which was uh, disruptive to the colony. But, uh, you know, he did some good things. He built the wall. So thank you, Peter Stuyvesant, for you know, building the wall. Uh, but he also did some, some things that history would, if not condemn, say w were very antithetical to the success of the colony. Uh, he, uh, he was a pronounced, I guess is the right word, Dutch reformed um, church um, advocate to the point of persecuting just about any other religious practice that might want to take place in the colony. Uh, Quakers, Lutherans, Jews. Uh, when you read the original Dutch, well, the translations of the original Dutch correspondence with Stuyvesant, he could not have been more aggressive in his hatred of Jews and put into place many, many different uh, uh, laws that basically said, you know, Jews are not welcome. Jews cannot practice their faith in a synagogue. They can't have a church. They can't even worship at home. You know, they need to go out in the woods somewhere if they want to practice, you know, their, their faith. Uh, it, so he was a tyrant in that respect, too. We haven't talked about the patroons, did we? Let me go back here. Okay, well, uh, up here, next to Fort Orange, you can't read this, and I apologize for the blurriness, uh, Rensselaer Vik is the name of a patroon ship. Mr. Rensselaer was a patroon. A patroon was somebody designated by the Dutch Republic, not the Dutch West India Company, to have a large amount of land with the promise that it would be settled. And there were several patroon ships created. His happened to be the most successful and long lasting, but they didn't answer to uh, New Netherland. They ran their own colony. They had their own people. They had essentially their own government. And there was a lot of conflict, fast forwarding again, between, in this case, Stuyvesant and the patroons. Uh, they were at loggerheads over, you know, how to exploit uh, some of the um, areas that uh, they controlled, lots of turf battles, as well, border disputes with the English. And I'll show you a map in a second of what I mean by that. And then political con conflicts with the nine men. We haven't talked about the nine men were the council that was created in New Netherland, nine, nine men, they were all men, uh, to, uh, they were given the power to make decisions. Stuyvesant wouldn't let them. So he ignored the nine men, really, to, to, to the end of his tenure when the English finally took over. Real quickly, uh, nobody's heard of Andrew van der Donk, I suspect. Uh, he, uh, he's a forgotten hero. He was an antagonist of Peter Stuyvesant. Very bright guy, came out of Leiden University, uh, came to uh, the colony in uh, 1641, actually went up to Rensselaer Vik as his first stop, and he worked for the patroon and was very effective as a manager of that patroon ship up the Hudson River. Uh, then came down uh, and established his own patroonship in what is now Yonkers. And Yonkers being a bastardization of the name that was given to it, Yonkir, or Young Squire, meaning him. So Yonkers, it was his patroonship. Uh, he was arrested for his political activism, I guess I'd call it. He wanted to create more religious freedom. He wanted to take more power away from Stuyvesant, which Stuyvesant didn't want. So he was arrested and imprisoned and ultimately sent back uh, to Holland, uh, you know, get out of town on a rail, so to speak. Ultimately, you know, he, pu he petitioned the government in Holland to overrule Stuyvesant on all this and side with him, and he won. 
And in 1648, the Stats General said, we're going to reform things back there. We hear you. We're going to take care of that. And they did. Uh, in the process, this is a fantastic book that I really commend to your reading. A Description of New Netherland. This is a translation of his book written in, I think it was 1653. What was it up here? 1655, 56. Uh, it's an it's a incredibly detailed account of life in, the, in those times. It's not a political document. It's what was it like to be up in that patroon ship? What was life like? What were the Native American tribes like? Because he interacted with them a lot. He did a lot of exploration on his own. And uh, really fleshes out this whole uh, context of what, what New Netherland was all about, what it was trying to accomplish. A uh, very uh, coherent and lively narrative. So that's that book. You can find it on Amazon. And then finally, uh, went back to, uh, came back to New Netherland in 1655. He'd been ostracized and was promptly killed um, in an Indian attack. So it was a very sad ending to a very interesting and compelling life story. Uh, only now are more documents being translated that tell more of the story of his political activism, and it's really an incredible story. I got to move this along. Got too many pointers and so forth. So I mentioned encroachments by the English. This was a map, uh, I want to say, in about 1660. Remember, the first English takeover was 1664. And you see this vast area, which is New Netherland. Here's the Connecticut River. Here's the Hudson River. Here's the Delaware River. New England is over here, little tiny wedge, according to the Dutch. This was a Dutch map. This is what they thought of New England, <laughs> you know, interlopers. But, you know, in real life, this was a deep, deep threat because as we know, New England was expanding. It was coming down and down and down. Here's Massachusetts, here's Rhode Island and Connecticut, and they're moving to control the Connecticut River, which they ultimately did, and moving west and west and west. So it was, an, it was considered an enormous threat to the ultimate success of um, New Netherland. So here's that history again, 1654. Uh, the English threatened to invade only for peace to break out in the first of three what are dubbed the Anglo-Dutch Wars. So there were three of them in a period of 20 years. The first one ended in a truce. England didn't invade. This was the Treaty of Westminster. Whoops. 1664, Charles II says, okay, to his brother, we're going to go get New Netherland for you. Hence the name New York. Uh, Colony was attacked, the English were successful, the Dutch surrendered, and New York was founded. 1673, I mentioned the 600 soldiers who were able to take it back. And then finally, a third Anglo-Dutch war ended in a settlement where the Dutch were horse trading for different territories in the West Indies and elsewhere. And so they traded away, essentially traded away New Netherland to the English. And that was, that was the history. Okay. I said half, of, or Richard said half of my talk would be about the history, half about genealogy. So how many of you ever, how many of you have actually tried to dive into early New York Dutch records? Okay, good. Good number of you, that's great. Has anybody had a good experience doing that? No? You're saying yes. It, uh, the church records. Church, I'm going to talk about that, yeah. Very good. Church records, good. Uh, so first of all, just this is a laundry list of the societies and um, organizations and libraries that seem to you know, dominate this field of genealogical materials. 
and access to records and genealogical uh, resources. The Holland Society, private society, uh, private membership, pretty hard to get into, but it sits on a vast treasure trove of materials. Uh, the Holland Society includes, back in the, back in the day, luminaries such as Cecil B. DeMille, uh, Humphrey Bogart. Uh, the two Roosevelts, Teddy and FDR, were both members of the Holland Society. Uh, they're very much involved in genealogical research projects, which I'll talk about in a second. The Dutch Colonial Society, also a little bit hard to get into, but they are very involved as well in promoting genealogical research and offering genealogical tools. I would say the, the, the big, the, the whale on this list is the, uh, I got the wrong one up here. It said <laughs> the New York's, uh, get out here. the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society. I've got New England on there. That's a typo. So I'll call it uh, NYG and B. You can subscribe. It has vast amounts of research source materials, but also a lot of different guides. And I'm just going to hold up as kind of a show and tell some of the things that you might find really helpful. Uh, some of these I got at Roots Tech last year. Uh, you have to pay a few bucks for them, but they're there in the uh, exhibition hall. Uh, this one is a guide to all the New York birth, marriage, and death records. Uh, incredible detail. I've used it. You can come up afterwards and look at it if you'd like to get a taste. Okay, that's one. Uh, then they go uh, borough by borough. There weren't boroughs back then, but today, borough by borough with guides to research materials in each of the boroughs. So in my own example, uh, my folks were both from Brooklyn and Staten Island. There's a guide here for, uh, actually, Staten Island is Richmond County. So I have this one because that's what I care about. But they have one for each of the boroughs in New York. And it has lots of different uh, listings of materials, many of which are not online, but know that they're there. And if you make an expedition to New York, which I've done a couple of times, these are you know, materials you can uh, access. Some of it is obvious, but uh, some of it is kind of deeply um, unknown. They do a publication, a catalog, New York Family History Resources. I'm not going to dwell on the details here, but this is another great publication. Lots of detail in here about you know, where you might look if, you're, if you've hit a, a brick wall, so to speak. Uh, New York Research is, Researcher is a periodical that they publish. Uh, I'm not sure if it's accessible if you aren't a member, but the membership is pretty cheap. Uh, but this comes out once a month, and they have lots of different uh, learned uh, papers in here. This one that I've printed out here says a gold mine of early land records. So it talks quite extensively about how to do your research on early New York land records. It's not just New Netherland, it's you know, New York. So it's a great publication. And again, if you join, uh, you'll get a lot of different uh, learned papers on things that might be of interest. Uh, I should mention that if you are a member, how many here are on uh, Find My Past? Do you know that? No. So Find My Past is like Ancestry or Family Search. It specializes more so in English, Scottish, uh, uh, Irish records, uh, but also some that would be US uh, resources. If you join uh, NYG and B, you get free access to the Find My Past databases. Uh, so that's a great you know, freebie for the membership. You can also upgrade. Pardon me? How much is that? Uh, what did I pay? I want to say 60 bucks. For a year? 
Yeah, it's an annual fee. So, but they have a, if you're interested in New York resources, it's the, it's the society or the organization to belong to. It's worth the 60 bucks. And they do a lot of online seminars, you know, several a month on different topics. So you can sit in your home and on your computer and get a lot of, it's kind of like the New England Genealogical Biological Society, which also does a lot of, you know, online seminars. So it's a great organization to belong to. Sorry for the typo up there. Did I get it all? Oh, and then uh, you, you'd think I worked for them, but <laughs> it's a great organization. So this September uh, and every September, they sponsor, along with the New York State um, uh, Family History Center, a conference up in Albany. It's a three-day conference, kind of like Roots Tech, except it's New York only. And they have a lot of different speakers and uh, teaching modules and so forth about how to do your uh, New York uh, research. So I've actually signed up. I'm going to go. Uh, this is on their website if you're interested in exploring it. It has an agenda and that sort of thing. It's a schlep, I know, to go to New York, but if you really want to break through that brick wall, as I do, it's the reason I'm going, um, it, this may be the place to go. Oh, one more thing. You were mentioning the church records. NYGNB, as well as other organizations, have collections of the Dutch Reformed Church records, which are crucial to your research on early Dutch ancestries, because pretty much New Netherland was run by the churches, not by a courthouse or a you know town hall or something like that. So if you want to find the real nitty-gritty information, you go to the church records. This publication is actually a listing of the Reformed Dutch and German churches of Manhattan and the Bronx. Uh, a nice list that you can scroll through and say, oh, I'm interested in the Dutch Reformed Church in Flatbush, which actually I was interested in. Anybody know the original name of Flatbush? I'll come to that. Okay. Oh, let me go back. So uh, just to finish off this list, if you're a New Amsterdam descendant, as in New York City. The New York City Municipal Archives have records, not all online, in fact, very few. Uh, the New York Public Library. Uh, I've been to this uh, Irma and Paul Milstein division many, many times. It is a giant part of the New York Public Library devoted to uh, early American genealogical materials. And they have all of the New York resources there that you could think of. They also have a, a map division, if you're kind of a map nut, which I am. So if you think you know where your ancestor was, uh, chances are there's a map, big maps, that they'll bring out of the vault and show you the map. And they did this with me. And you can sit there on this big you know, table and look at the map, and there's your family name on the map, because you know they would label the tracts of land by the family name. So you can look, in my case, Staten Island. Oh, there are my people. They're on this map from 1680 or whatever. So the map division is a really cool place to go. Uh, the New York State Archives in Albany, they have digital collections. They also have this project, which I'll talk about in a second, the New Netherland Project. Okay, so my personal favorites, I just mentioned the New Netherland Project. What are they doing? So about, at this point, about 15 years ago, uh, some people at the New York State Library uh, took a look at what existed in terms of English, English translated materials on uh, the early Dutch settlements. And they discovered that, you know, a huge percentage, 80%, had never been translated. And that which had been translated had been very poorly translated. And one of the uh, difficulties with that is that a lot of the original Dutch, Dutch records were written in Old Dutch. 
and you could be a fluent Dutch speaker today and not know what you're reading. So you have to find people who actually have, have educated themselves and become expert in reading Old Dutch. And then you can start to translate. So some big translations were done in the late 1800s, which were then considered sort of the Bible. And when they started to look at this 15 years ago, they said, hmm, you know, those translations weren't very good. So they've started to, they finished redoing some of those original translations. And now they're moving on to the vast warehouse of Dutch records that are still in Dutch. That's the New Netherland project. Literally, they have some guys in a back room at the state library, windowless back room, who spend eight hours a day translating those original Dutch records. Um, and we're, we're blessed to have any because uh, record keeping was not really good back in the day. And when the English took over, a lot of those records were lost or destroyed. So what's left, though, this project is underway. One of the ongoing outputs of that project is as they finish some segment of these materials, they put out translated versions of, in this example, correspondence 1654-1658. And I was explaining to you earlier that, that what survives, you know, there's a lot of correspondence between New Netherland and the bosses back in Holland. Two-way traffic back and forth, sometimes, you know, months. It was kind of like Plymouth. But what survives is the inbound correspondence from Holland. The outbound correspondence uh, has not been preserved. So you get the... The, the, the folks in Amsterdam writing back saying, got your letter, we're really upset about what you're doing, uh, which was most of the time what they were saying. And so that correspondence has been translated. That happens to be what's in this book. It gives you a flavor of the politics. It certainly gives you a flavor of what Peter Stuyvesant was all about, because he was smack in the middle of this time period, 1654, 1658. And you can see the increasing agitation in Holland about what was going on in New Netherland. There are a lot of surnames in here. So in terms of your genealogical research, don't overlook the possibility that your ancestors are showing up in this translated correspondence because it wasn't just, you know, hi Peter, it was going deeply into who was doing what in the colony not just in New York City, not just in the boroughs, but up in the patroon ships and so forth. I've actually gone through here and found some of my people referenced in these materials. So there's more than this one book. You can take a look at it afterwards. Uh, I think I got this from NYGNB. Yeah, I think they sell these things. But it's out there and you can order the book and it'll come. I think Amazon has it too. So that's a new Netherland project. A um, lot of raw information in some older books, one of which uh, is a pretty dense, one might say impenetrable uh, book, Lists of Inhabitants, Colonial New York. And it just jumps right into, you can see here, you know, town records, with names showing up for different things, uh, you know, land grants or whatever. And you literally have to just go through it page by page and find your person. You can see from my, what do you call these things? Post-it notes. Okay, my people are in here, but I had to, you know, page by page. But this is a great resource. Uh, the uh, Holland Society does have a journal. I don't know if it exists in anywhere in Nevada as a collection. But in the New York Public Library, for sure, because I went through it, they have uh, you know, decades and decades of this uh, journal called the Halvey Mann Journal after Hudson's, named after Hudson's ship. And lots of learned papers in there. I don't know if they're online. I should check that out. They, 
they may be, but not the entire collection, which goes back, as I say, to the early 1900s. Uh, you'd be surprised what's in there. I found some things that were relevant to my own research in the journal. I mentioned the Dutch Reformed Church records. I didn't bring examples of that, but um, you know, different churches uh, kept different levels of records. I might actually have... How's my time? I don't want to overstay my welcome. Here. Am I good? Is everybody okay? Okay. Tell me if you're not. <laughs> I might not have brought it. Well, I, I have some title pages of books, but you know, they're they're fortunately they're not in Dutch. There's some uh, readable lists of births and marriages and that sort of thing. Uh, there was a changeover when the English took over uh, in 1674. Suddenly, the churches mattered a lot less. And while marriages and so forth were still being performed in churches, it kind of turned to the civil authorities under the English. So there's a giant shift in how the genealogical records were maintained once the English took over. So you have to be mindful of that. You could be reading church records and suddenly you think, oh, well, it's 1680, I can't find anything. Well, it's because the English took over. And now they're over in some other records that aren't in the church records. Um, we, county and town historical society records. I'll tell you my war story in a second about that. Uh, and the rest of it you can, you can see here. If you go down the, the hill to Oakland, God forbid, uh, the California Genealogical Society Library, which is across the hall from the Mayflower Society Library, has a big collection, actually, of New York resource materials. Uh, so it's another, we don't have it in the Family History Center here. It may be in the Cal State Library in Sacramento. I don't know, but I know for sure that the California Genealogical Society collection is quite good. Uh, so you could try that one out. Some perils and pitfalls, and some of these come from my own experience, uh, sometimes a mind-numbing experience to trace your what you think is your surname, first of all, to Dutch records. Uh, so I'm just, these are real names in my ancestral line. So I had uh, Oak Johns, who was from north of Amsterdam. Sometimes he was John, sometimes he was Z.E. He came from Nuis, which is an area north of Amsterdam in UIS. Uh, very often they would attach your, your place of origin to your name. So he no longer was Oak Johns, he was Oak Johns van Nuis, because that's where he was from. And then that would shift over time, then he was what we would say today is Van Noyce. And you all know when Southern California, Van Noyce, well, it came from him. So that's the Van Noyce family, but it, the original derivation was he came from Nuis in, in Holland. So that's Oak Jans Van Noyce. And then I have uh, Pietro Winant. My father's middle name was Winant, so I come from the, the Winant family. Sometimes it was Winant, sometimes it was Winans, Winans, so on and so forth. But the Winans also came from a place called Ek Unweil, which is east of Utrecht, a little farming town. Uh, and I visited that. There's nothing there. Uh, but that's where he was from. And so they tagged onto his name uh, Van Eck, because he was from Ek Unweil. So now, you, now you're looking for Winant, but it's over here under Van Eck, you know, so it, it, you have to think creatively about how to search your surname because this will throw you off for sure. Two more examples, the Waglums married the Winans. So they were from uh, Waglum, which was in a Dutch town. Uh, the original guy who came over wasn't Waglum, but they tagged that onto his name. So it became the Waglums, Van Waglum, and then shortened to just Waglum. And then lastly, the Disaways. This one was really way off. You know, they were French Huguenots. The original name was Du Sachet. Somehow it became Disaway. 
How would you know that? How would you possibly know that in your research? Uh, so that was my own, you know, perils and pitfalls. Some more place names were moving around a lot. I asked you what was Flatbush originally called. No, no correlation at all. Midwout became Flatbush. Brooklyn, where my Winans first went, well, that's Brooklyn. That, that's easier. But that was the original Dutch, and Staten Island became Staten Island. So the place names, you have to be mindful that if you're looking for your ancestor in 1650 and you think the person was from Flatbush, well, you know, it wasn't Flatbush. Uh, so you just have to be mindful of that. Uh, counties didn't exist. Uh, a lot of the outlying communities just didn't keep records. I mentioned the patroonship, Rensselaer Vike. If we didn't have uh, Adrian Vanderdonk's uh, correspondence and so his book, uh, you wouldn't really know much about what was going up in that, uh, going on up in that patroonship, much less who lived there. So that's a hard one, and you have to kind of rely upon almost hit and miss from available records. If you, if your ancestor wasn't sitting in New York City, but was upriver or downriver, um, or some of the other outlying areas, what did happen, by the way, is some of the settlers when they first arrived spread out into the countryside. But when the Indian Wars picked up, really by ju almost judicial fiat, everybody was pulled back in. So there weren't any more outlying settlements. But in that process, I mean, there were no records kept of who was out in the wilderness. Um, I mentioned the, the transition from church authorities to civic authorities that can throw you off. And then when the English control took, they, when they took over, there was a lot of records that were just plain old lost. Um, okay, uh, I talked a little bit about my New York Public Library experience, but uh, uh, they, they do have a rare books and manuscripts room, and <laughs> it's, it's pretty frustrating. So if you think there's something, you, you can go online and see what they have. If you think there's something there that might be a hit for you, first of all, you have to order it way in advance. It's off-site in a vault somewhere. They have to bring it to the rare books and manuscripts room, or I should say, in the back. You show up, you have to make a reservation. You show up, you say, I want box number so-and-so, I've reserved it. They go in the back room, somebody with white gloves comes out with the box and gives you the box. And maybe you want three boxes, but they'll bring one box. And you go one file at a time you can't take any copies. There's no copy machine there or anything. So I ended up doing a thousand iPhone snapshots, right? Because there's no way to get a copy of anything. And then you put it back in the box and then you say, okay, like the next box, I take that box. So it's a very cumbersome process. I spent days doing that, but it's a very rich treasure trove. It's worth the trip uh, to do that. Uh, with my Staten Island ancestors, you know, I did the whole gamut of going to churches and looking at gra uh, graveyards. And my, my real uh, 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 find was wandering into the little tiny Richmond County Historical Society. This is in the middle of Staten Island, which is today no place to write home about. But at the time, Staten Island was really quite an important place. It's, by the way, where the British first arrived during the revolution, when they were going to take over Manhattan, they, their first stop was Staten Island. Uh, there were a lot of loyalists on Staten Island too, but uh, the Richmond County Historical Library, nothing is online. They have the original, almost like parchment paper there. And they'll actually let you touch it. I was kind of surprised. Yeah. Well, no, no, I didn't really know. And and very nice lady there. Uh, I mentioned my, the Wynet is the is the surname. I said, well, I'm a Wynet. She, oh, you're a Wynet. Okay, well, we have over here. And she brought out these files, original parchment documents, contracts, uh, bills of sale, land records, all this kind of stuff. Uh, she kind of did have a copy machine, but I needed more than she was willing to copy, so I was doing that again. Uh, you don't want to look at my phone. So, uh, but you'd be surprised, I guess my 
thesis is you don't know what you don't know. Go to the library, see what they have, see if you can find somebody who's been around for a while, and you know you might you might get lucky. I guess is the way I put it. In that case, uh, the the woman who was staffing the, the the history library there said, "Well, you know, there's somebody over, you know down the street basically who is a whinin. You might want to talk to that person." Gave me the phone number, right? And I called the guy. Sure enough, you know he's a descendant from the same people. And he had done a lot of research himself, and he never left the island. So his branch of the Winans were still there, and he had all of these, you know, connections. And by the time I was done with the conversation, I realized I had my own genealogist on the line because he'd done all this work. So that was just, you know, again, dumb luck. But Lucky. local residents, word of mouth, different story. My son's American Revolution patriot ancestor. I found him when I went to the town where I thought he was from. The, the lady who ran the history museum there turned out to be a relative. She was descended from the same guy. And she had a bunch of papers in the back room. So, you know, you just, you never know. This is my Staten Island tour. Uh, one of the original churches, the graveyard, where a lot of my winants are buried around a tree. <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I don't know why they would cram in like that, but they did. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the contracts, bills of sale, I found in that historical library, um, you know, between one of my ancestors and somebody else, you know, selling some land. They did have a, like a card file. You remember the days of card files, right? So they had a card file, and here's my Peter Winant and give some information about him and other references to where you could go uh, to find things. You know, so, you know, Mark, oops, this fellow Mark Winant at the bottom and Samuel. Samuel is my direct ancestor. Mark is his father. So, and they came to California. They were oystermen. Staten Island was a big oyster uh, industry and it still is uh, on Staten Island. So they came out at the time of the gold rush to plant oyster beds in San Francisco Bay, uh, but that's the winds. I mentioned the map room. So this is just a close up. So where is it? Here's Winan Street, which is still there. Winan Street, and elsewhere on the map, there are big plots of land that say Winant on it and so forth. I don't know how to do this, but one of these days I want to superimpose. I, I, the te technology exists where you can have an old map and a new map on top of each other, something like that, like Google, uh, Google Earth, is that what it's called? Something like that. But it's, it's a fun project for, for some other day. Um, I'm going to stop there. I thought I had another slide here. I think I do. Summing up. So I'm not prejudiced since I am in the Mayflower Society and the Jamestown Society, but I do think... New Netherland is just as important a story, really, truly. Uh, a whole lot of our social, cultural, and political history can be traced to New Netherland. A lot of, a lot of, uh, actually, after the English took over, they couldn't shake Dutch culture. It persisted and persisted. And today, you know, all the place names are still Dutch. We were having a discussion about whether it's the Van Wyck or the Van Wyck Expressway. Anyway, Van Wyck, Cortland Park, you know, the Vanderbilts, the Roosevelts, uh, you know, it's endemic in New York City still today. And for, I think, 100 years after the Dutch takeover, Dutch was still the primary language in a lot of the churches and a lot of the communities. They never stopped being Dutch for many, many generations thereafter. So it's a very long-lasting cultural influence that, that I think you, I lived in New York for about a decade and you still feel it in the culture. Um, you know, I mentioned the fraught relations with the Native Americans as the black mark. Uh, but, uh, you know, those of you who have your Dutch ancestors, do more reading. It's an incredible story. I've got some other books up here which I'll just quickly advertise. 
The Colony of New Netherland. It's all on your partial reading list. A great book. Uh, this one is pretty darn interesting. It's called Explorers, Fortunes, and Love Letters. I think this might be in the library here. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, it's a series of uh, papers written by various scholars about New Netherland and telling different aspects of the story. One's about Henry Hudson, one's about Rensselaer and the patroons and so forth. So that's a good book. Um, History of Ancient Families. A lot of these, you just Google them, they're, they're online. Um, and some of them, like archives.org, it's free. Um, it's kind of clunky once you download it, but it's free. So that has the benefit of being free. So, and then other things on your reading list that I gave you. Uh, again, you can't, you probably don't want to read it all, but if you read half of it, you'd come away with the same feeling I have, which is this is an incredible story. Well, again, I invite anybody to look at these materials. Um, and then one last plug for the SAR meeting and our two speakers. Things are in the back to, uh, to take with you, and I hope we'll see you then. Thank you. Thanks.